Today's scripture reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's command lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. weeks that we feel literally beaten down and destroyed. Anybody had weeks like that? This is real life, isn't it? I think this week I've been functioning in a little bit of what you would call a brain fog, if you will. Times where something knocks the wind out of your sails and you just, you sit down to think, you sit down to process, and you just, you can't get things out of your head to focus. It's been one of those weeks been one of those tough weeks. It's been one of those weeks that you feel the tears fall down your cheeks and, and, and the emotion well up inside of you and you think, man, God, I can't be where I want to be right now, but I know you can be there. So God, show up as only you can. That's been my heart and that's been my prayer. This week, we got a phone call. Becca got a phone call from one of our dear friends in New Zealand and her husband had just passed away. 42 years of age, four children, two still at home, and a young couple that we mentored and we would say were very close friends like family. And all of a sudden, he's gone. The fragility of life, the realness of eternity, the realness of saying goodbye far too prematurely. And Becca rang me. I was still here at the church, and it literally knocked the wind out of me. Didn't know how to process that as a pastor. You know, you, you deal with death and dying and eternity all the time. But there's just those moments that just say, wow. And it leaves you in a bit of a brain fog. Clinging to that eternal hope that we have, but the sorrows and the grief that can be overwhelmingly deep within our very innermost being. So Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that it be your words and not mine. God, I pray that you take the scripture and as as Jackie said, illuminate it, enlighten us to understand you at a deeper level. God, meet us where we are in the high points and the low lights of life. Encourage us, love us, challenge us and change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we dive into scripture, we, th- we, meet a, we meet a woman. A woman that by a glimpse you would know that 
It's been a tough life. It's been quite rough. That the years have not been good to her. That she's been rejected again and again and again and again. Deep sorrows overwhelmingly true in her life. Obstacle after obstacle. Working hard to make ends meet. Trying to find her way without knowing her purpose in life. The years had been rough. Skin like leather from the scorching sun of the day. Hands like sandpaper from the hard work and labor that she would experience. A body that was worn down and probably progressively more than her actual years. And you'd have to ask the question, has life treated this woman fairly? Because she was still looking for something. She was looking to see what life had to offer her. And I think you could conclude that there was a great sense of emptiness deep within her. As she faced that rejection over and over again. It was in the mundane of her existence that her life was about to be radically changed. That something beautiful was going to happen. That an encounter that she would remember for eternity. And it was going to flip her life upside down in a good way. And she was going to experience a transformation that she never thought possible. She was going to discover her purpose. And all the hard labored years of her life would soon make sense. You see, it was about noontime. And as an outcast, she didn't gather where all the other ladies of the day gathered. She didn't get together with a large corporate group of community that she would say, are my friends. Family had pushed her aside. She was an outcast. She would go to to find her livelihood and her provisions. And upon approaching the well, she would notice a man. Perhaps just catching a glimpse out of the corner of her eye. And she would begin going about her business, drawing her water. Upon getting closer, the man, a Jew of all things, asked for a drink. This was impossible. This was completely countercultural to the day that you see men did not talk to women, especially if they didn't know them. And a good statured man definitely didn't talk to an outcast and someone of another race. Yet he asked for a drink. And Jesus began sharing about living water. This, this truth that many of us here today understand and uphold that we understand what Jesus is getting at when he talks about water that you will never thirst again. Water that will quench everything in you and give you something to long for and look forward to and understand your purpose. As he begins to tell the woman about him offering this living water, she practically inclines to understand that he has no bucket, he has no rope, he has no ladle, and he cannot give her what he says he will give her. How will he draw the water from the well? We start seeing the theological understanding unravel as Jesus is teaching a principle about eternity. He's speaking the truth. And the woman recognizes that Jesus is more than meets the eye. Because he peers deep within her story, deep within her life, at an understanding that someone on the periphery could not pinpoint nor understand. And he says, sure, I'll give you this living water. Go get your husband and bring him to me. Oh, caught red-handed, right? Married before, rejected again and again and again. The man she was with was not her husband. And we see a relationship form and a bond of accepting her right where she was at. That Jesus, the Messiah, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, would extend grace upon this woman. Not only grace, but he would go the extra mile to show that he dearly loved her and cared about her. That he knit her together in her mother's womb. That he understood the challenges and the trials of life. And he wanted to just say, come home. Dear child, come home. Jesus changed everything that day. 
he connects the dots a little bit further. And he reveals to her as she understood, yes, I've, I've heard of this Messiah. And what does Jesus say? That in whom you speak of is me. He declared he was the Messiah. He declared that Jesus was the Son of God, and her life was forever changed. Something beautiful happened with this once rejected, hard-labored life. She became an instant missionary to her people. She was an instant evangelist that quickly became a missionary to all the Samaritans a downcast society, a set-apart group of people that wasn't welcomed in the world. And literally an entire race of people would hear the gospel due to this one encounter at Jacob's well. When Jesus crossed the cultural boundaries of talking with women, talking with a different ethnicity than him, and explained about the living water which he offers. You know, it's an amazing thought to me that this was no chance encounter. That God has very specific plans and, and, and he loves us and he meets us right where we are. And I think about the Samaritans. I think about the ripple effect from this one encounter that changed an entire town and community that heard about Jesus. And I just wonder if that encounter didn't happen, would it have been 10 years later when Paul was really active in his ministry to the Gentiles? Would that have been many people that wouldn't encounter Jesus for a very long time? God had a very specific purpose. He said society might label these Samaritans as outcasts and downright terrible people that don't belong in the good positions of leadership that aren't welcomed around my table. And God said, I love them. I love them. And I want them to understand the gospel. I want them to understand of what my son Jesus will do for them on the cross, to die for their sins that they could have eternal life. It's a beautiful thing. You could say this woman quickly understood what it meant to be a follower of Jesus. She wanted to share her story to every person she would encounter. She'd be like, you, you don't understand. I had this meeting with this man and this Jesus is the Messiah, and it's incredible, and I want you to know about him. Matter of fact, I'll take you to him because you need to meet him. You need to understand who he is because he offers something that no one else can. Introduce Jesus to the people she loved and cared about, even if they rejected her. So it brings me to a question of today that I want to look at, of saying, what is your slogan? What is your t-shirt tagline? What is it that gets you out of bed in the mornings to keep you going, to keep you motivated, to keep you excited about your relationship with God? What keeps you focused to be the Christ follower that you desire to live out to be day in and day out to God be the glory? What's your slogan? Think about that for a moment. That day an encounter with Jesus taught the woman at the well about living water. She believed and she was changed. She quickly began walking the walk and talking the talk. No theological education, no extra letters after her name. She didn't go to an evangelism 101 class. She wasn't even baptized at this stage. And she became the greatest missionary to the Samaritans that I read about in scripture. And it's an amazing thing. Let's have a little exercise. Where do these slagans or these taglines come from? Just do it. If you've not noticed anything about me, I kind of like Nikes. I kind of like Jordan shoes, right? So just do it is Nike. All right. Think different. Anybody know? This is active participation. You get to talk in this part. Think different. Apple, all right, think different, thank you. How about this one? Where's the beef? Wendy's, where's the beef? Between your teeth. Melts in your mouth and not in your hands. Totally not true, totally not true, all right? So you get the point. So as Christians, as Christ followers, we ought to walk the walk and talk the talk. 
If you're going to wear the brand, wear the brand. You see, folks, there's nothing more frustrating to me than seeing very grumpy, very hate-filled, unforgiving Christians. I, I, I don't see where we're to understand that. I don't see where this instructs us to be hate-filled people in the world around us. And, and it's, okay, if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, remind your face that we ought to be the definition of joy in the world around us. Amen? I want people to understand the joy that I have because I have a freedom. I have a living water that no one else can understand outside of the church. So church, if you're happy and you know it, all right, remind your face, smile at me. You're in church. You get this opportunity to gather together with other believers to say, Holy Spirit, how would you have me to grow today? God, help me to leave church differently than the way I came, that you have something more that I want to learn. I want to apply in my everyday life. So if you're going to walk the walk, if you're going to talk the talk, wear the brand. And wear it consistently, seven days a week, 365 days a year on a leap year. Guess what? Do it an extra day. Even when you have to get up an hour early to come to church. Now, let, let me throw a disclaimer. If someone comes in here in about 40 minutes, just scoot over and say, oh, you can have this seat right next to me. It's okay. And they're going to think, man, Pastor Josh preached really quick today. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 16 says, As, as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Challenge? Is that confronting? Like, woo, Jesus set the bar high. Yeah, he did. He absolutely did. And he showed us the way. And he said, I'm not going to leave you empty handed. You see, if we leave it to our own strengths and our own devices, guess what? We're going to fail miserably. But we get to say, Holy Spirit, strengthen me, encourage me, help me to grow, lift me up, guide my footsteps that I might bring honor and glory to your name in all I say and do. You see, guys, church is a lot more than just this time together on a Sunday morning. I think it's a great tragedy that when we come into church and we tick a box to say, I did my Christian thing for the week. And, and maybe we sang some songs and we sang it with gusto and all of our heart. We put money in the offering plate. We said hello to some people we didn't know. And we go home and say, God, that's my part for the week. That's my duty. And we wake up for church on a Monday morning and we have to remind our face of that joy that we carry. We have to remind ourselves of the grace and love that Jesus showed the outcast. The person that made bad decisions. The person that was isolated and pushed aside. So what is the church? A building? An hour or hour and a half or maybe longer if the pastor's long-winded that day? Once a week? Is the church me? Is the church you? The church is us. Us, the hope of the world. And, and I say that boldly and confidently that when Jesus ascended into heaven, before he would return again, he says, my plan is that you would go be like that Samaritan woman. You would go share my story to the ends of the earth. That's what Jesus said. Right? His plan is you and I, and there's no plan B. No pressure. Be holy as I am holy. So if we are the church, let us be consistent throughout the entirety of the week and not get all of our good out in an hour on Sunday morning where we do our politicking shake hands, kiss the baby, smile, and then we yell at each other all the way home. Okay? 
We make poor decisions throughout the week and say, oh, God, I'm sorry, whoops, over and over. But let us be sincere in this journey of discipleship that we cling to and uphold to say, God, how will you make me more like you? Today, tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, repeat it all over again. We serve an infinite God that always has more for us to learn. Does anyone have a PhD in Christianity? Does anyone have a crown or a medal that they parade around with to say, I'm the best Christian I can be? No? No one has those extra letters after their name or any endorsement or a certificate that you got or a conference that you went to? How many of you love Jesus with all your heart? That's what I'm talking about. All right? That's what we cling to. That's what we uphold. That's what we live out day in and day out. God can do a lot with that, church. So it's so much more than an hour on Sunday morning. How about this? Chapel Pike Wesleyan Church, where love is more than words. I like it. I like it because love isn't a word that we throw around all that often. Maybe to our wives or our husbands or our moms or dads or grandparents of Love you. I got a confession. I am not a touchy-feely guy. I'm not a romantic. Uh, I'm sorry. Right? But trying to embrace this idea of love, this brotherly, sisterly love within the family of God, what does that look like? So I, I think about this, and, and I think where love is more than words, that our actions ought to reflect what God is doing in our lives. True? It ought to drive you to do things that culture around you says, why do you live that way? But might we also use words to communicate the truth? So I say let us do both. Let us say it. Let us do it. Let us be it. Let us be the love in the world that God desires us to be. Because I think the world around us is hurting and needs a better definition of love than what so many things offer. So I think about this in telling people, Becca, I love you. Brotherly Christian love. Chris, it gets awkward, doesn't it? Because we, we do things like this, like, I love you, bro. Because we got to hold on to that machismo. Like, love you, bro. It can get awkward. But how important is it to not only do the actions, but actually say the words? Because I would venture to say some of you haven't, been, hasn't, haven't had another human being stand in front of you to say, I love you. I believe in you. I love you the gifts, the abilities, the talents that you bring to the table to honor and glorify God. I think we ought to use the word sometimes as well. So how are you doing in loving those around you? Sometimes the most difficult people to love are the people under your very own roof. Sometimes the people in your family tree. Sometimes the stranger that's sitting beside you in church this morning. How do you love the people around you? Let's take it a step further. How are you doing in loving yourself? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. God adores you. He thinks you're amazing. So how are you doing in loving yourself? Because I think right there is a really difficult thing to do for people sometimes. How are you doing? Our scripture this morning reminds us of the importance of loving those around us. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? That'll preach.
when was the last time you acted in love for someone? When was the last time you acted in love for someone outside your own family? When was the last time you let the word flow from your mouth? Something that you uh, might pick up about me is I really love a good little magic show or card trick, right? I'm just, I'm like a little kid in a candy store. When people do a cool card trick, I'm like, that was amazing. How'd they do that? And I try to figure it out and I fluff it a hundred times. I'm trying to do it. Like I got maybe one good card trick that I do and I use it over and over and over again. So if you need to see a good card trick sometime, ask me about it, okay? But I love magic shows and I really love Christians do a great job, you know, using that as a tool of evangelism. But there, there's a group that you might be familiar with, Penn and Teller, the real tall guy that speaks and the little short guy that only talks to Penn, right? Penn is a almost like a proselytizing atheist. He's like, man, I don't, I don't buy this religious stuff. I don't, I, when we die, we die and that's it, okay? And he shares a story about after one of his shows, a man came up to him. He's never met this guy before. And he said, "Uh, I'm sorry, Penn. I just, it's really on my heart to give you this. And and, and I don't want to be forceful. I want to be respectful because I know where you're at as, as a person and your philosophy and your thought process. But my God has really put it on my heart to give you a Bible. If, if I would give this to you, Penn, would you accept it? He said, yeah, I would. Thank you very much. And, and he said a, a very good conversation ensued around that, and they had a lovely interaction that it was all about love and grace. And he said, now the guy didn't win me over for Jesus, but I felt loved and respected as an individual. And he said, but it made me ponder, how could you hate someone enough that you wouldn't tell them about the eternal hope you have in Jesus? It was a question for Christians. How could you hate someone enough to not care about their eternity? To withhold the information, to withhold the gospel truth that Jesus died for the sins of the world that we might have eternal life? It was a profound question. So I hear a lot of pastors, or I hear a lot as a pastor, excuse me, I don't hear a lot of pastors preach this, but I hear a lot of people in the church to say, well, evangelism is not my gift. I'm really nervous. I'm not eloquent in speech, and I'm not very theological or philosophical, and Well, I I just try to live my life so that people would see Jesus in me. That that's my uh, initiative of evangelism. Do you see a problem with that? Do you see where that falls short? That's a lot of pressure on me. That that if my evangelism, if if my goal of reaching the lost and and reaching the people around me is, well, they're just going to have to see Jesus in me. And they're going to have to make a decision on whether or not they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior or not. What did I just do? I put me as the focus. Josh Bolin is the focus. is not a good focus, right? Because it's not about me. It's about him. So let us be the Christ followers that live, be holy as I am holy, right? That live like Jesus. But might we also use the words to tell them, the why behind how we live our lives. We got to help connect the dots, folks. Let's keep it as simple as possible to say, oh man, Becca, you are so filled with joy, even in stressful times, even in hard times. Why? Because I love Jesus and Jesus loves me. Let me tell you about my Lord and Savior. You see the difference that begins to make? So we have to figure this out. So if we're going to wear the brand, if we're going to focus on a, on a slogan of, of love, let us not only use the actions, but let us use our words as well. Make sense? So when loving others, let us truly care about where they're going to spend eternity. 
You see, we, we often kick around this philosophy of, no, I love and respect them where they're at, and that's okay. How can you love someone if you're okay with them going to hell? I, I'm sorry, I don't see how that adds up. We have to care about where people spend eternity. We have to take it full force of hitting our knees and praying and saying, God, I don't know how you're going to reach this person that I love and care about, but they don't know you. They're far away from you. Lord, if it's me, use me. If it's someone else, let me pray for them. Let me encourage them that they might help them see the light. They might understand the sacrifice that your son Jesus made. Let us get real about eternity. Let us live our lives as an example and let us tell them the reason why. So may we share the gospel message in every relationship and every opportunity that we can. So I ask you this again. What is your slogan? Make it personal. Because if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So we have to be intentional. So what are your goals? What are your dreams? What are your aspirations? See, far too often I see Christians living in a mundane existence, going paycheck to paycheck from one day to the next with no aim for anything greater than ourselves. That's a sad reality that far too many people embrace. The creator of the universe, King of kings and Lord of lords, made you. He loves you, he cherishes you, and he wants to do something great in you. And guess what? He desires to do it corporately as well. With Chapel Pike Westland. And we get that opportunity to be change agents in the world around us. How incredible of an opportunity. So may we learn to dream again. Might we say, God, help me shoot for the stars. May we be a part of something beautiful. Let us love each other and those around us. That the world would be changed because you and I are in it. And God is in me and you. Hope of the world, no plan B. And I love the words from John the Baptist as I close this morning. He must increase and I must decrease. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts. Challenge our actions. Help us in choosing our words to bring honor and glory to your name. Holy Spirit, thank you that we are not alone. But you help give us the words. You help Strengthen us to extend the actions and you guide our footsteps. So might we be active participants in your story in the world? Might we not be passive? Might we not just sit on the sidelines and say, oh God, that was neat. But God, help us to get in the mix of it all. Help us be willing to get our hands dirty in people's lives when they need to pick me up. God, help us and drive us to our knees when we just need to cry out to you. God, help us to sing at the top of our lungs, screaming from the mountaintops that you are God. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us, that we might have eternal life. And God, I pray that you would use us to be a part of other people's story. That it was an encounter, not a chance encounter, but a purposeful intent. That you met the woman at the well. And her life was forever changed. God, some of us are in this very sanctuary because an encounter we had with someone that gave us an invitation to come. Changed our lives forever. And I give you thanks. So God, help us to live boldly. Help us to be radical in the ways in which we conduct ourselves in the world around us. Might you smile upon us and give us your favor. We pray in the holy and awesome name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all of God's people said, amen.